Welcome to the Startup Grind. You guys, you guys are the best audience, I think, out of all the startup grinds in the whole world. Whoa. How'd that feel? Good. <laughs> <laughs> like the price is right. Like the price is right? Yes. <laughs> so here at Startup Grind, we, we like to do things differently. We think it's, it's important where people started. And so we like to go back to when you were a girl at home and, and talk about what your life was like at the beginning. So I am from here, from the area. Um, I grew up in East Lansing and Lansing. Um, my parents were, I guess you would call them sweet, sweetheart, high school sweethearts. But um, really what happened was is my mom got pregnant. So <laughs> she was 17 and he was eight, um, 19 when, they, when she got pregnant. When she had me, she was actually 18. But um, basically she was a freshman at MSU. He was a sophomore. They had gone to high school together previously but um, wasn't really a planned thing. Um, but I came along and I'm like the best thing ever. <laughs> but um, so that, my mom dropped out of school um, so she could get a job. And she supported the family while my dad um, continued full time at MSU to finish his degree. So um, we lived in a 570 square foot apartment for the first 10 years of my life. So, I mean, but I'm not going to say that I came from, like, poverty or anything. We lived in a little apartment for, like I said, the first 10 years of my life. But, um, you know, I had lots of, I had everything I needed. Um, and they ended up getting divorced when I was eight. And then my mom, you know, raised me, or I lived with her by um, myself. But basically, you know, we didn't have a lot but had everything that we needed. I grew up around MSU because we lived on campus and... Um, family housing so my roots are very much at MSU and it really kind of showed me hard work because she had to quit school um, but she always um, would take like, a class every semester and she ended up getting her degree after 14 years so I just kind of learned that you just persevere um, you know maybe you can't go to school full-time but you just keep going and 14 years later you get your degree so I think I learned a lot from both of my parents, um, seeing that they had to work and go to school and raise me because I was a surprise. <laughs> so I think that's kind of where um, maybe my uh, work ethic comes from. So a little background. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's impressive. And when you were young then, did you, how, how did that, how did you think about your future when you were growing up? So. I think that I thought I could do anything I wanted to do. I had support from my parents. I had support from my grandparents and like extended family, uncles and aunts. Like I was the only grandchild, the only child. Everyone thought I was like, you know, the bee's knees. And they always taught me that I could be anything I wanted to be when I grow up. Um, and one thing that um, I'm all for like women in STEM areas and obviously I'm in a STEM area, but one thing that kind of upsets me sometimes is like there was like this one campaign for a while about um, girls being told they're beautiful and that you shouldn't say that, you should tell them they're smart um, because you don't want your girls to grow up thinking that they should just be beautiful, you want them to grow up thinking they can be smart. But like what I am challenging with that commercial or campaign is why can't we be both? Like, I, I mean I was always told I was beautiful, I'm not a model, but I was always told that I was beautiful and that I'm smart and that I can do whatever it is I want to do and study in school. And so. I really, the whole package. I really think that the most important thing that you can teach any child, boy or girl, is just like you, there's opportunities, like what are different opportunities, expose them to different things in the world and let them try different things. Um, and they encouraged me to do a study abroad like youth exchange program. So when I was 16, I did a youth exchange to Italy. Um, it was through the Lions Club, which has like a really good youth exchange program. Um, but it was just during the summer. I didn't actually go there for school, but I did leave when I was 16 for several months and do a youth, you know, exchange program to Italy. And, like, things like that, like, I think were very impactful to show me that there was a larger world um, and to give me confidence that I could travel somewhere by myself um, and 
navigate and get where I was supposed to go, even if someone was meeting me at the airport when I got there. Um, I think just kind of having those um, experiences and being taught that, you know, I, I can have confidence and do different things. I think confidence is one of the most important factors that I was taught. That sounds like an awesome supportive environment that you grew up in. Is it when you were, when you thought of yourself when you were older and had your own family and you were a kid, what were you envisioning? So around the, I can't really remember from when I was like really little, but around the time that I was 16 and I went and did this like youth exchange program, I totally thought that I was going to be the um, American ambassador to Italy. That was what I was going to be. And then I found out that Shirley Temple was at one point the um, American ambassador to Italy. And like I haven't seen like a lot of curly headed women role models. So I'm like curly hair ambassador to Italy. That's what I already said I wanted to do. Clearly, <laughs> that's what I should do. Um, clearly, my path has changed since <laughs> that um, envisioning. But I did end up going to MSU for um, dual degrees in political theory because, again, I was interested in that track. Um, and then also telecommunications, which is um, now media and information, which is the, the web design development route that I ended up going farther in. Very cool. When you were young, did you have any any job, any companies that you started, or you sell cookies or anything? I didn't when I was young, no. Not that I can think of. Um, my grandparents um, did own businesses, so I was exposed to seeing that. My, um, my grandpa and grandma had gas stations that they owned, and then my other grandpa, he, um, he had like a full-time job as like a accountant, but um, he was a farmer, which really is an entrepreneur as well. So I remember always seeing him just working really hard, starting in the morning, going into work, coming home at five, and then putting on his overalls and going out and getting on the tractor and farming, you know, until it got dark and you couldn't see anymore. So I think from both sides of my family, I just kind of learned about hard work and putting in the hours to get things done. And did you have an opinion on if you wanted to have a business or not when you were older? I think that... At a young age, it wasn't something that I necessarily really thought about. Um, so not necessarily. It wasn't until um, I got to MSU and then actually um, even into my master's. Um, and after I finished my master's, I got involved in an entrepreneur venture um, through MSU where basically we had these brain-powered games. And we were trying to figure out a way to um, basically turn this into a business through MSU. Um, and we got connected with an alum who was an angel investor um, and lived in California. And he invited um, a small team of us out um, that to come and visit him and kind of have like a weekend workshop at his house. Um, and he basically went through, and he told us ahead of time, you have to read Art of the Start. Um, so we had our homework assignment to read that before we left. Um, we got there, and then we had this um, full weekend where basically he had whiteboards and different things, and we like were flushing out like our idea and where we wanted it to go. And he was basically coaching us from an angel investor point of view of what we need to work on and what we need to think about, um, because you know he could have been a potential venture uh, investor, or he could have hooked us up with other potential investors, or exactly how is this going to grow? And that really opened up my eyes a lot because it was hands-on experience, learning from you know, this angel investor about what they look for. Um, so that was like a really valuable experience. And then in that position, I ended up you know, working with the team to help secure. We ended up going with grant money um, to build out this small suite of games um, and kind of try different things with them. So that was kind of like my first little entrepreneur venture that I worked on, although, it wasn't like maybe a true entrepreneurial venture because I was under the safety net of MSU. Um, it was, I was an employee of MSU at the time. But um, that along with other positions that I did have because I ended up working at MSU in other positions as well. Um, as a faculty member, um, I ran all of our um, pre-college programs that were basically summer camps for video games and film and um, web development. And then I also taught um, project management and web development, and I also taught remotely to high schools in rural Michigan that didn't have technology classes. 
Um, so I would teach to them remotely so they could have access to learn web development. Um, but through all of that experience, I really was given a lot of freedom and flexibility to shape um, kind of the initiatives and what I wanted to do. So um, it kind of was like being an entrepreneur in a way um, and having freedom and kind of thinking of initiatives, acting them out, figuring out how to solve the solutions, um, reaching out to other people of the team to get things done. Um, so I feel like my different work experiences along the way have really um, helped me to think about problem solving and running a business. So you had the work experiences and then you had this experience with the angel investor and the, and the game and so then you thought like, well, I'm done with MSU, I'm just going to go start my company right now. So that's what happened? N not exactly. So after the um, Brain Games thing, um, I, so my husband had done a few other sign language companies previously. Um, he wasn't my husband at the time. <laughs> but, um, and he had actually partnered with um, someone and they were talking about doing this dictionary, which is what Signing Savvy ended up being. And they had started recording videos already in, in his garage, um, and, but they hadn't like pulled it all together and done anything yet. You can't start a startup anywhere else, right? Right, so exactly, it has to start in the garage. Um, but what happened was, is it didn't work out with the Brain Power Games. Um, you know, we had some success and they did end up to go and do other great things, but not really in the sense of like a successful business. So that position ended. And instead of looking for another position, I said, hey, why don't I focus on full time trying to help get this off the ground? So basically, it was me plus you know, my husband and our other partner, but they were just ha had full time jobs. So, but I was kind of like you know, the rooted one without a full time job to kind of like keep it on track, work on it, do the front end coding for the website, um, and you know, really try to get it off the ground. And that's basically I took off, I think it was like 10 months I looked it up. And that was the time spent to kind of get Signing Savvy started and off the ground. And then we launched it, and then I got a job. <laughs> because we didn't really know what was going to happen and, you know, would it, you know, how it would grow or not grow. So basically I got another job at MSU. That was actually when I took the job um, that was managing all the pre-college programs um, and teaching the different um, classes at MSU. Um, and I ended up doing that for three years. So it was kind of like we had launched Signing Savvy. We would maybe work on things, you know, in the evenings and stuff, just a little bit here and there to, you know, keep it going in the momentum. But I was working a full-time job. Well, then it was starting to be lots of people using it. It requires a lot of demand. People contacting us, technical support, customer support you know, just needing to make updates and maintenance and wanting to do more with it and not having the time because basically everyone on our small little team was just moonlighting, you know. So um, that's when I decided that I should quit and I should go full-time signing savvy. So I did that. Um, and that was, would be three years after we launched um, the business. And now I've been doing it for four years. Um, and there's, you know, other people on our team too who are also doing it as well and not just moonlighting now. Um, so now we have a small team of people that are working on it. Um, and that's kind of where it's been. That's very cool. So let, let's go back to, to that 10 month period. Yeah. So you decided I'm not gonna work on anything except for signing Savvy for 10 months. Yeah. And then at the end of that 10 months, then you decided I'm gonna go get a job. <coughs> what, was, what was going on in those? Before I mean, you decided on the 10 months and then, and then during and after? So. I actually did do like a few consulting jobs at the same time um, and luckily I had the security of my husband who I think we were not even married yet. I'm not sure. I can't remember the, the I can't remember the timeline there. Her, her husband may or may not be in the room. <laughs> I'm not sure if we were married or not. Um, I can't remember. But um, either way, um, obviously I had that support um, of we were living together. Maybe we were married. I can't remember. Do you remember? 2000 and okay we were married I'm pretty sure we were married yeah okay <laughs> so so yeah okay we were married so anyway so then yeah I had the security of of that um, but even to flash forward again 
to make the decision to quit my job, even at that point when it's proven, we know that we can pay myself and some other people to actually work on it. Um, you know, do I quit my job at MSU? This is such, such a good job. I'm, a, I'm like a faculty member. I teach and I do all these awesome things that I really like and I have great benefits and, you know, 403B yeah, and, yeah. and all this stuff. And, you know, that's a scary decision. And really, I think that it's so hard for us to um, really decide to do that, like anyone in general, um, especially when you like have a family, is like because of insurance. I mean, insurance is like a huge thing. You want to make sure you have insurance for yourself, you have insurance for your kids. So luckily for me, I could get that from my husband. Um, and if I didn't have that ability to get insurance from my husband, I don't know. I might have not been able to make the same choice. I think like healthcare is such an important factor, like in our nation, to be able to support entrepreneurship. Because if you can't have affordable healthcare, how can you quit your job <laughs> and have like an unpredictable income? And I mean, it's scary. So I mean, basically, so, so th this is the three-year period after yes. the ten-month period. Yeah. So then you're you're really scared and you're thinking about quitting and you're, you're kind of on the fence about it. Yes. What what pushed you over? I mean, it really just got to a point where someone had to be paying attention to signing savvy. Did I want to do it myself or did I want to hire someone else? I mean, we had, you know, a lot of users, a lot of, like, just maintenance and, um, like I said, technical and customer support that had to be dealt with. It was exhausting to have to do it at the end of a workday. And, you know, I was ready for trying something new after being at that position for a little over three years. So, you know made the decision to do it. How do you think about that, hiring somebody else versus you doing it yourself? I'm a total control freak, <laughs> so <laughs> that makes it very challenging. Um, I mean, I'm somewhat good at handling, like, handing things off to other people, but, I mean, when it's, like, your baby, it's, it's your, your company, um, and there's just, like, you know how to do everything, it can be hard to figure out how to hand it off to someone else. But I think it was also at the point, and continues to be at the point, where we're still constantly wanting it to be like just the best sign language resource ever. And we are so passionate about it and like so passionate about helping people that like why wouldn't I want to be a part of that? I mean that's what it is about for me and for our whole team is the whole mission of Signing Savvy is to help people learn sign language or to communicate with someone that you know is deaf and you know needs you to communicate with sign language. So for us it's all about that mission. And with a lot of the different things that I've worked on through MSU, I've always kind of had like that, what's the mission, what's the purpose, let's do something for good. And that's really, I think, why Signing Savvy has been like so, such a success for us. Like just personally, not in terms of like its individual success, but successful of how it makes us feel is because we feel like we're doing something good. So it keeps you going. Even if there's like a hard day, <laughs> it keeps you going because you feel like you're doing something good. So when you have 10, 10 million users, every day is not just easy? You're not just li living the life? <laughs> well, I mean, for the most part, a lot of things are automated, but things always do come up. Um, and, I mean, there's always challenges, you know, with running any business. So, so let's, let's go back to that 10-month period. I know we keep yeah, hopping around yeah, in time. Yeah, um, so were there cash flow issues? Is that, is that what was uh, kind of driving the decision to go back to work? Um, yeah, it's definitely a cash flow issue. So basically the goal was um, take time off, work on this, get it up, and then go back and get a job again. And that, was the, goal, that was the goal from the beginning? Yeah, that, that was the goal. I mean, well, pretty much just because we didn't know exactly, like, what would happen, how long it would take, um, you know. And our main goal was really just to let's, let's get this up there, let's get it started. Um, so... It was probably not like the typical that you would see with like a lot of businesses because um, we had more I guess of maybe like a just mindset of let's get it up and see what happens with it um, kind of philosophy. So if there are business owners in the room who are struggling with cash flow issues. How do you think they should work through those if they're thinking about consulting and jobs and working on their business? Yeah. I think it's super challenging, and again, for me, like one of the big challenges was health insurance. So obviously, if you have someone that can help provide health insurance, that's like a really big one that can help eliminate that. In terms of cash flow issues, I mean, there's really not an easy answer for it. You can eliminate like your bills, or you know, minimize your bills so you need less overhead personally. Um, 
it's just it's really hard. Obviously, you can go for funding, um, and you know try to bring in investors or take out a loan to kind of let you get farther down the road. Um, and lots of people do that. Like they'll get out, get enough money through investment or through loan or whatever it is, and they'll know, okay, well I have roughly this amount of time um, that I have until I need to figure out something else. <laughs> um, or you do other jobs, you do consulting and you know whatnot. Sorry, I don't have a good answer about cash flow. <laughs> did you explore investment or loans? We never did. Um, we never did, and part of that too is kind of like again a control issue, um, not wanting to give up control of the company. Um, also knowing that we had all of the skills in set, like inside in the house, to kind of like figure out what we need to do and do it. Um, so it's just to start off, we didn't feel like we needed to. Although I have to say that like although now we've been around for a while and we have lots of um, users, we're still at a point where. Sometimes we kind of have to think, like, okay, are we at a point where we need to shake things up and maybe we need to take on investors or do something big to, like, be even bigger? Because, again, our goal is to really be the most comprehensive resource there is. So right now we're a dictionary and we continue to add, you know, all the time to our dictionary. We have a lot of learning resources and tools that go with that, but we want to add other things to the whole set of resources. Um, and sometimes it gets hard when you're managing like this whole company with all of these users and just keeping it going in terms of, you know, blog articles, social media, si scheduling sign of the days, um, customer support, tech I mean, there's just all of this stuff that you have to do just to maintain. Um, I mean, even just technology in general changes. So, you know, you make a website and have it up in 2009, but you're going to be needing to make updates in the meantime because you can't just let it up, be up there and not make changes. Um, and even still, there's changes that we should make to make things more mobile friendly even. Um, we do have mobile apps, um, but I mean, there's always things that need to be updated. And not only that, like anyone that's in technology knows there's so many different platforms, so many different hardware, like you're always running into little bugs that like are like weird cases that you need to fix. I mean, I just looked it up and we have like over, I think it was 5,300 um, different mobile devices that are using Signing Savvy. So when you have over 5,000 different devices using like your website, like, oh my gosh, yeah, weird things are gonna come up. You thought everything was great, but some weird thing will come up. And then, what do you do? Like, we're testing in the testing environment. It's working fine for us. We have a bunch of Android devices. We have a bunch of iOS devices. We're testing everything. We can't replicate the issue. Like, and then you're like, is it a user issue? Are they just doing something? Like, you don't know. So you know what? A few times, we've just had to go on and order whatever their device is. <laughs> We have ordered it because there's no other way we could possibly figure it out. And maybe if this person is having it, someone else is having the same issue too and they just haven't reported it. So I can think of at least two or three times that we've actually gone and purchased <laughs> like a tablet or a phone that we didn't have and just chalked it up to, okay, it's one of our testing devices. Um, but I mean, it's really challenging because of just the number of devices running different operating systems of different degrees of age. Um, and obviously there's some that you just can't support. I and mean, we, we have requirements that we say, like nothing older than such and such, um, we can't support. But even that, if we get a question from you, we're gonna check and see if we can fix your issue. Um, you know, if we can, we do the best we can. But if you're running an up-to-date operating system, even if it's some crap phone that I personally would never want to use, that just doesn't mean yeah. that we can't support you. So if we try everything else, we check every device, then yeah, we ordered stuff before. <laughs> Sounds like you really take care of your customers. We do the best that we can. And um, so when you had your, your company and you're in there full time some of the time and not some of the time, and then yeah. you've got two other partners, did that, and one of your partners you're in a marriage or marriage with? Yes. Um, how did you guys think about equity or how did you work, work that out? So, um, we kind of split equity up um, between like me and my husband, or it's, it's me, me and then the other person. 
um, who's the, so basically the way the business is, is um, our other partner, he's the sign language expert. So he is like the signer you see on the site, and then my husband and I, we handle the um, technical, I, I handle the business operations, um, and a lot of the technical stuff too, so like the front, front end stuff and content development, like the signing partner, he does signing content, but I'll help with blog posts and different things that I can help with as well. So, um, and we actually added a new partner, so who is also a signing expert. Um, so now we have four of us. So it's kind of like you start off, you figure out how you want to split it up, um, and it really just, you have to kind of look at it and decide. I mean, and then the difficult part is when you add another person, <laughs> is figuring out, okay, well they're coming in later in the game, and how do you do that? And it really just is complicated and having to figure, think about things that you never think about. One thing that I really would recommend to anyone for any business is to have a good lawyer that you trust um, because we have had lots of different things, not just like with negotiating internally because we don't really have internal issues, but we've had a lot of different partnerships that we've done where we need to review contracts and sign them or, or we need to create contact contracts and have other people sign them. And it's really important to have someone you can trust that like knows what to think of ahead of time because that's what the lawyer's job is to think of is problems you would never think of, um, they can kind of help m mitigate what might come in the future and put it into the contract. It's really just about laying out terms. So like even like with having a partner, you have to think about, okay, well what happens if you die? Or if I die? If one of us dies, what happens? Like, so like, does this go to your descendants? Or, in your, that's not the right term, but <laughs> does this go to the people in your will? Like, do they then have voting control? Like, cause you know, or do they just get like financial like benefits of that percentage that you own? Um, so those are all things you kind of have to think about and you know, very carefully because you never know what's gonna happen. So I think that it's just helpful to have a lawyer that can help you think of all of those things that you might not think of yourself. Um, and the lawyer's been helpful with these third party negotiations, but not for the internal well, no, I'm just saying, like, we haven't had a lot of internal problems. The only thing we've... You guys sliced the pie and it was easy? I'll, pretty much. It was easy to just figure out what we wanted to do, sit down, talk about it, and we all are pretty calm and rational about it. Do you have any tips for audience members that might not find it so easy? I mean, I guess it depends how many partners you have. Um, I would always recommend that one person is slightly more than 50%. It's nice to have one person that has control or the last say. Um, that's something to think of in terms of voting rights, and that's something to think of. I mean, it's not, it's not really a financial issue. It's not like a, you want to get more financial benefit. It's more about if we both have different opinions at the end of the day on something very crucial, whose vote counts for more. <laughs> um, and it's something that you hope doesn't happen, but it's something that you need to know. Um, so I think that's the most, the best tip that I have. You think in a three-way partnership, there should be like a 51% that one person has and then the other two split the remainder? No, 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 sorry, not necessarily, um, not at all. One just needs to have more. So like if it was three-way, you could do one person has 35% or something. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so then, so we've talked a lot about signing savvy kind of starting out. Yeah. And how did you, how did you go about getting customers at the beginning? So I really wish that I had some magic thing to tell you because I really don't. Please do. Um, <laughs> like I just looked up again what our current like breakdown is of acquisition. So we have 75% comes from organic search. So that's the mass majority. Um, currently the next 20%, um, which brings us up to the 95, um, comes from direct links. So, you know, obviously that's reoccurring. I did actually try to go in and look at our first year, what the breakdowns were, so I could share that, but unfortunately Google did not have yeah. data on that. I have data on the number of users we had the first year, which was like 550,000 by the end of the first year, but I did not have any data on the breakdown of acquisition. You got 550,000 users in your first year? Yes, so my, my only tip that I have. What about, what about your first month? Um, I didn't check month, but I did check three months, and that was a little over 100,000. I mean, how do you how do you reach that many people? The best um, advice that I have for you, which is not 
I think that helpful because a lot of people already know it is that you just want to make sure that you have really good organic search, search engine optimization. But the other thing that you want to think about is, um, and I don't want to discourage you from going to any specific kind of company, um, but if you can think about the kind of, if you're, if you're coming up ra with random ideas, um, one thing you might want to think about is like the competition in those areas and what does it cost to play in that area, to be a player in that area. One just really quick um, way that you could kind of get an idea is if you could go to the Google AdWords free tool where you type in keywords and see basically how much it costs to run ads for those keywords. Like that's just one really quick way that you can kind of see roughly how much, like what is expensive versus not expensive um, in terms of advertising. And I'm not saying you need to do a bunch of advertising. I'm just telling you it's, that will give you a rough, really rough idea of markets and maybe what um, is harder to penetrate than others. And again, I'm not trying to steer anyone. To, if you have a really great idea to not go for it in whatever that area is, because you might be the great next big thing in that area, but it helps you to know maybe the hurdles that you'll be facing in certain areas. So another thing too is um, I um, have taught the project management class for several years, and we do the um, Google AdWords online marketing competition in that class. And Google's basically says you can do any com any company and can be a part of it as long as they haven't used AdWords, I think, in the last six months or three months, something like that. Um, but they recommend that it's not um, a lawyer or insurance or, like, they had a few different areas. Now, the reason why they say those areas is because those are the harder areas to penetrate with ads, and they give the students $250 each, and they want that money to kind of go farther and let them be able to play around with it more. So I guess my point is, if you want to be a lawyer, don't not become a lawyer <laughs> or create a law-related product, but just understand that it might be harder to penetrate that market. Um, I actually know someone who their really cool product is for lawyers. It's like a device, it's an app you put on your phone, um, and then basically it will, every phone call that comes in, it basically can track, like you could say if it's billable or not billable as soon as it comes in. So then it will keep track for you of all of your billable hours you get on your cell phone because now lawyers are using their cell phone a, a lot more than they used to and it's hard to track billable hours that just come as a random call on your phone. So they have this really cool app but they're having a really, or, or at least were, having a really hard time kind of penetrating the market because it's super hard to advertise legal services. Now they're not selling legal services but it's really hard for them to still um, kind of get the um, advertising using those same keywords targeting lawyers. So, I mean, it's just something to think about and like I said, a tool that you could look at to get a really rough idea of, you know, what, how expensive or harder it is to play maybe in different arenas. Um, for us, when we started, there really wasn't like a lot of other choices <laughs> out there. I mean, you use sign, for sign language. For sign language. For, I mean, you would use a book. So like in a class, you get a book and like actually in LCC's classes, they don't even have pictures. They just have descriptions of each sign. I um, mean, the teacher shows you at the, at the front of the room how to sign it. But if you like were to buy a dictionary, like a sign language dictionary, you open it up to a page and it shows you, you know, a picture and it has like some arrows giving you an idea of like how you would move your hand. Um, but it's really hard to tell from a picture. Um, so when we started, there really wasn't a ton of other websites that really had a comprehensive video um, showing signs. So, I mean, that was part of what made us, I think, be able to grow so quickly in terms of users is just that, you know, it was less in the, in the marketplace. And I can tell you that I also checked um, today what we are paying currently for just like per click for Google AdWords, and I have them down to a penny, a penny per click. That's like super, super cheap. So like, I'm just saying, like, it's an unfair advantage of the arena that we're in. And that's not at all why we chose it. We were passionate about sign language and building this great sign language tool. We were lucky that we were not, you know, pushing a, a legal <laughs> tool. <laughs> um, yeah, it sounds like your go-to-market strategy was like content heavy, natural ranking. And then the market you hit didn't have anything near right. where you guys were at, so you guys were a lot better solution, and it just right. naturally took off. Yes, and of course we did look um, ahead of time at like you know competitive analysis of what else was out there, it, you know to help confirm this was a needed thing. 
Um, and that's what you know made us really get even more excited and passionate about it. Like, there's nothing else out there. We need to really do this. People need this. Yeah, I guess that's like kind of a tough one because probably not a lot of people in the audience are, are in that position. Do you have any advice for people out there, you know, trying to get their, their hundredth customer or their thousandth customer? So, okay, let me think. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's hard because so much of our stuff does come from organic traffic, um, but I can tell you like the other things that we do do. Um, so obviously we have like social media, we also do like newsletters. So when I looked at the top five um, ways that people come to our website, it was like organic, direct links, then it was ads that I pay for, then it was um, our email newsletter, and then it was Facebook. Um, those were the top five. Um, and one thing that we've done to kind of like tie things together is we have a sign of the day. So every day there's a different sign. Now, just like anything, when you have a company, your idea kind of evolves. As you start, you're like, let's have a sign of the day. And we have um, basically sign we put every day. But at first it was just random. It was just programmatically random sign of the day. Um, Obviously, then we started to get a little bit smarter when one day maybe a word came up that we didn't think was appropriate for the sign of the day. So then we got smart and we're like, oh, wait, wait, I don't think it could be random. So then we, you know, we have a very, very complex system now um, where basically we have signs marked as mature um, or mature language and different things so we can do better filters so that we're not grabbing things that we don't want grabbed if we are doing a random. But now sign of the days are never random. <laughs> um, now they are all hand selected and like reviewed ahead of time by our contact content experts and our advisory board. We have them review them, make sure that they agree that they're good. And then we took it a step farther. I researched every national day that there is. So like, you know, national puppy day. Mm -hmm. um, and now every single sign correlates to a national day. So you're gonna get, you know, whatever the day is, you're going to get the sign that matches that day. Um, and then in, in addition to that, um, you know, we thought, hey, we need to start incorporating more deaf culture. So then we took it a step farther and we started to think, like, uh, research, like, get deaf facts associated by dates. Like, and uh, now, um, you know, Gal Gallaudet is the one that's coming up as the sign of the day because it's, like, the day that they were opened or the day that whomever signed the thing to open them. So like, you know, basically now we're kind of not only doing national days, but also tying it to deaf culture and things that have happened in history so that people can also learn little tidbits with their sign of the day. So it's really evolved from let's pick something <laughs> random to oh wait, no, let's fix that to let's be thoughtful about this, let's do it really good, let's have people be able to learn at the same time. Um, and then now we've also added even like example sentences. So all of our sign of the days, you can see the sign. But now we've also added videos. You can see like a whole sentence signed um, in ASL that uses that um, word from the sign of the day. So we just keep adding on more and more. But then it's tied to social media too. So every day we tweet and we post on our Facebook page the sign of the day with links in the morning. Then in the afternoon we post links for the um, the sentence of the, or the sentence of the day, so that's in the afternoon, and then of course we have other posts in there that are not related to the sign of the day as well. But at least every day we have two posts pointing back to our site of content related to that day and about that day. So I think like when you're kind of thinking of maybe like your social media strategy, like if you can think about if I want to post something meaningful for my users, like once or twice a day, what could that be? Is that something I can? schedule out and plan out and what's going to be meaningful and helpful for them and then schedule it <laughs> and have it every day and then you can add other things in in between but don't do random <laughs> that's a good tip so switching gears quite a bit earlier you talked about that when you started the company you didn't feel like uh, that you should take investment or or get loans because you had the skills you needed but then you said looking out in the future you guys are thinking like to take this to the next level maybe we should need to get some investment yeah what, what's the thought process there I mean, so the, thought so the thought process is, is we have a lot of users. Unfortunately, we give, or fortunately, we give a lot away f for free. So we have membership and we do obviously have revenue because it supports me and other people as well to be working on Signing Savvy. Um, but 
we really need more if we want to be able to hire more people, support more staff, and do more cool things. And like I kind of said, like sometimes it's really hard to get past even just like the day-to-day -day maintenance things that you need to do and have time to get to these really cool projects that we have on our list because we're so busy just kind of handling the daily things that have to get done. So, I mean, that's kind of where the idea of are we at a point where we should maybe take investment or do a loan or do something to level up? Um, like, you know, just thinking about what's next for us. Do you have a vision where you want to be in five years? We have definitely visions of what we want to do with Signing Savvy in terms of how we want it to grow and we want to add more learning resources to it. So we want to add basically more like lessons, both more intro lessons, but then we also want to add things that are more for advanced signers as well, or people who are not just taking the very en entry level stuff, which is actually why we've added the sentences with the sign of the days, um, because um, ASL um, is not the same word order as English, so a lot of people struggling really a lot of people learning really struggle with understanding like how to actually sign it in the proper ASL like word order since it's not the same as English. So that's why we actually added those examples to the sign of the day is to make sure that we have that for those more advanced people and give them examples. But we would like to add a lot more stuff like that. We'd also like to add more built-in teaching tools for teachers. Um, so whether that is at like a, a you know elementary school level or a high school level. Um, we would like to be able to make it so that basically people could like pull together, like they can already create word lists and share them. Like for example, a teacher could create a word list and then they could share that with their parents and say, this is what we're learning this week. Um, this week we're learning this in school, here are some signs because um, you know, then they can know what's going on with their kids. And also 90% of um, deaf children are born to hearing parents. So a lot of time the hearing parents are also struggling with learning ASL. So if a teacher can better communicate at home what's going on in school and what the kids are learning, then the, the parent can help learn at the same time. So we already have that is already part of our membership. Um, but we want to add more things that teachers can do to make it easier to like maybe have like more like groups of word lists and more resources that they can be sharing with their parents or with their students. <clears throat> we're gonna we're gonna open up for questions here. If you guys want to form a line over here, but not all at once, you come over here and you can ask uh, ask Jillian your own question. In the meantime, then just for me to kind of reiterate what I heard yeah. there, sounds like you feel like 10 million users is like a lot, and instead of focusing on getting into 11 million users or 12, yeah. then it makes more sense for us to provide more value yeah. to the customers that we're already serving and like finding exactly. ways to to deeper yes. service them. And that's really a big challenge for us is not figuring out how to get more people, but to how better serve the people that we already have. Um, exactly like you said. <laughs> what, what's been like the biggest challenge in growing Signing Savvy? Um, I mean, I think the biggest challenge has always or is probably having time because we all are very passionate about signing savvy and I think we just have a lot of ideas and don't always have the time to get everything done which is why it would be nice to maybe have a bigger team. Um, one thing that we did do that I would recommend any company do and do actually much earlier than we did is get an advisory board. So we created um, basically a deaf advisory board that we can call on to review different things or get advice from. And it also helps kind of give us more kind of clout and credentials that we have these great smart people that are, you know, consulting and working with us. And so I'd really advise like any company to try to do that. Like whatever your specialization or area is that your business is in, if you could get an advisory board, that's really helpful. Hey Jillian, so one question I have for you is, uh, I know you're completely a virtual company, yeah. so you don't have like an office or things like that. Yeah. Uh, from like a day-to-day -day type thing, how do you keep yourself from going nuts if you're never really leaving the house to, uh, you know, just work on stuff? You know, for me, like I find myself, even when I'm working from home like one day a week or something like that, I end up like talking to the cat all the time or <laughs> things like that, you know, and how do you kind of like handle that aspect of a virtual office? Yeah, so. 
I actually did have an office for three years. We were in the Technology Innovation Center, um, but then we graduated, so we were no longer in there. And I did start to look at other office space, but then at the time I was having a baby and then I knew I'd want to be at home more anyway. So I just thought it would be easier to work from home. So it's possible we may still get um, office space again um, elsewhere. But um, for now, the way that I survive is I do volunteering and different things, and that's kind of my way to interact with other people. So that's kind of why you might see me like at different events or volunteering for different groups or helping putting on different you know, things um, is because I need a little human interaction <laughs> sometimes. Um, because I interact with lots of people through Signing Savvy, but it's always virtually. Um, so, um, yeah, sometimes I, that's why I really, I volunteer, so I can be active in the community and see people in person. <laughs> um, it's kind of like a driver for me. Um, but also, my, kid, my kids are little. I have a three and a one-year-old, and they're at home with a nanny. So, well, the, one of them actually goes to preschool and comes home. But it's kind of nice to be able to be a mom working at home and have my three-year-old come home at noon and open the door and say, hi, mom, how are you? And like I can say hi to him and spend like five or ten minutes, and then I go back to work. Um, and he goes and does his thing and whatever else. But it's kind of nice to kind of have like this really nice work environment where, yeah, I am working from home by myself, but I do get an opportunity to like see my kids or check in on them, um, which is like really unique. I wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Um, there's also flexibility where if one morning I need to do something, um, run an errand, go to a parent-teacher conference, whatever it is, I can do that. I can work later at night, that night. Um, so obviously I make my own schedule. I still have to work, um, but that's one benefit is making your own schedule. The negative, however, is I think the saying is the buck stops here, right? So basically, um, if we go on vacation, there's certain things that I do that I can pass off, like several things to other people. But there's some things that, like, if it comes an issue comes up related to something specific, I might have to do it. So I'm on vacation. I still need to check in every day and make sure there's no fires burning. That I need to do it. It doesn't matter where I am, what I'm doing. I'm responsible. I need to do those things. So. So we, my own, I own a content marketing company and we focus on creating content, but we still struggle with engagement. And so you obviously have a very large audience and you're creating original content, really valuable content, but do people interact with you on your website, on Facebook? How do you create those conversations and make sure it's yeah. actually going somewhere? So we do have comments. Um, People can do comments on our blog articles. They can also do comments on even individual signs. Um, and then they can also contact us through Facebook or comment on our stuff on Facebook, obviously, or tweet, retweet stuff. So we are talking and engaging with people that way. Um, we do also, like, uh, recently one thing that I did, for example, is we had the interview, uh, we had the opportunity to interview um, the producer of, and like the person who started Switched at Birth, the TV show Switched at Birth, which is on ABC Family, um, where they um, basically they have a lot of signing on that show. So um, we had the, the opportunity to interview her, and instead of just coming up with questions, what I did is I pulled both Facebook and Twitter, and then I even sent out. We have like um, a lot of different like schools that are using signing savvy in the classroom and I know like some of the teachers so that was one advantage of actually being like a Michigan teacher that I'm, I'm connected to that I just like emailed also those specific teachers to say ask your students if you have any questions so you know basically I reached out specifically to classrooms I know using signing savvy plus those social media areas to say hey we're interviewing this person do you have any questions and then we got you know, really good questions from people that are way better than I could have wrote. Because I have seen the show, but I haven't like watched like it from the very beginning every episode. And we just got some really amazing questions. And then after we did that article, I I thought it was really good. But then it, it's one thing to think it's good, but then it's nice when you hear other people say, "Oh my gosh, this I read everything about the show, and this is like the best interview I've ever read." Had all this because like. Our people are about sign language, so they ask sign language related questions, not just, you know, random questions about the show and the plot. 
but like actually specific questions like why did this person stop signing on the show? This really pissed me off. <laughs> like what happened? And then she was able to explain they had an injury. They physically couldn't continue signing anymore. Their doctor made them stop. So it was just like we got these like kind of really cool details because we had opened it up to our audience and asked some different questions. You're welcome. I think one of the things that Amanda's maybe talking to is, you know, I might publish an article and I think it's great. Actually, there was an article I spent a ton of time on last September and I thought it was like the coolest thing. I thought it was the bee's knees. Yeah. And then, and then I put it out there and the world didn't agree. They didn't like it or they didn't hear it? Actually, yeah, they didn't hear it. You know, it's like crickets. Yeah. You know, one thing is I actually, so we have, to, we do an annual meeting every year um, and I pull together like basically all these statistics and everything and it's tomorrow. So I was pulling together all this stuff and I pulled together um, our top um, basically blog articles that had the most web page views for 2015. And like two of the, the two number top two ones are not new articles from this year. <laughs> they're older articles. They're just topics that really resonate for people that obviously they're searching on. So like one of them was about deaf education choices and it talks about like the differences between um, main school or mainstreaming or um, sending to like a all deaf residential school. It talks about like all these different possible options. Um, and obviously that was popular because people are just Googling it, looking for a resource and our resource comes up. So I think in terms of like, you know, having it be seen, lots of times it's not just because you just did it. It's really just the topic area. Like, is it something that people are searching for and looking for? Because that's why I think our top two were the top in 2015, even though they're several years old, was just because of the topic in general. But it is very frustrating when, you know, you write this really great article and you put it up and it has less likes than you think it's going to have or whatever it is. Um, and I think one thing that has helped is like inter interlinking of articles. So we interlink related articles on our website. So if you are reading the one that's about deaf education and we have like a few other articles on the same topic, at the end of the article it will say see related articles. You might already do that. But I mean basically by doing that I think like it really helps people find another way to do it besides just searching because obviously people don't always start at the home page so they don't always see the most recent thing. Um, they come in at some random spot, but if they found something they really like, well, then you need to feed them everything else related that they might also like. So that's kind of what we have done with starting to incorporate the related articles. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. You mentioned that uh, you're, you're a small team and you, you play many different roles yeah. from support to creating content. What kinds of tools or apps have you used or are using right now that you find particularly useful in, main, in managing all those, those different roles? That is a good question. Um, so I used to use Basecamp, but I don't really use that anymore. I use Trello more for making lists of things for in terms of like keeping track of lists for project management. Um, I have been using, I use Hootsuite, which maybe there's something cooler and new, newer that people use now, but I've been using Hootsuite for scheduling tweets. Um, and then, I mean, Facebook, you really just need to go in and schedule them through Facebook, I feel like, because it, like, I think that they, there's actually a scheme in there where they, like, like, get higher priority if you schedule them through Facebook. There is an issue with Facebook nowadays, though, where they really, like, you have to pay for things if you want people to see it. It's really kind of annoying. You don't always have to pay a lot, but a lot of things I know aren't getting seen because I can see the number of views not being as high. Um, but in terms of other things, like I use like my text edit program, <laughs> which is like not like a cool tool. It's just a text edit program. And I just, I know it drives my husband crazy because I have like 500 text files open <laughs> with like different notes on different subjects. And I mean, it's not, so I'm not giving you very good <laughs> answers of like a really cool tool you need to use. You can educate me. I'm sure you've made tools I should be using probably. <laughs> pretty certain. <laughs> Along those lines, it seems like a big theme that's come up is you want to do so much, but you only have 24 hours in the day. Right. You probably need to sleep and eat. Yeah. How do you decide what to do on a day-to-day -day -day basis? I mean, there's certain things that you just know, like, okay, a blog article needs to go up. 
Um, and the thing is, is I even have like a bank of articles from people, from my other partners, from guest, um, guest authors, from our advisory board. But it takes a lot of time to like actually get them, I know it sounds crazy, but to get them into the web format, add pictures, do editing, adjust things to make sure they have like good headings and are scannable and good for the web. Like, like sometimes I spend an enormous amount of time doing graphics. So I also do infographics. So an another thing that we're trying to do to kind of increase um, member va membership value is we might have an article that um, actually John just wrote that was like about doing like a restaurant activity in the classroom to learn about food and he talks about really good ideas of like kind of like a lesson plan of what to do and how to incorporate sign language and so we have links to basically different um, signs and word pre-built word lists so you can already take our pre-built word list and then kind of run with it with your lesson plan but then I was like, this isn't enough. We need an infographic showing you, like, you know, the top 10 fruits to start with and the top 10 vegetables to, sign with, to start with. And it takes a long time to create an infographic that has pictures of all the fruits and then has pictures of John signing, like how you'd see it in a book, <laughs> but like easy printables for a parent or a teacher to print out and have as a reference when you're not at the computer, which, you know, normally we do have a phone or something, but you can't always have it turned on in the classroom you know, or something that they could put up on their wall. So, I mean, it takes enormous amounts of time to do that. But it's like, I have a deadline. I know we need to have an article up this, this week, or we need to have this, or it's also controlled a lot by questions that come in and requests that are coming in. So those are pulling me in different directions as well. So, I mean, sometimes I do feel a little cheated because <laughs> the things that are maybe the top on my list that I really wanna work on, I keep pushing to the bottom because I'm doing these other things because they have to be done. Um, and I mean, there's other people working too, but just not on those same things. So, I mean, it's definitely a challenge to balance. But, I mean, it, I think that we have a really good resource and it's all, like, it's coming together and it's, keep, <laughs> it's, it's continuing to grow. So, absolutely, plug along. Well, the, the last question I want to ask you, what do you want to be remembered for? I think that's a good question, <laughs> and it, I know you told me that one ahead of time too. Um, behind the behind the scenes yes. secrets um, revealed. I think that I would like to be remembered as a helpful person. Like I think that's m the biggest thing. I mean, with signing savvy, I want to help people, and like if you need help, I want to help you. And if anyone here needs help, like I want to help you run your event, or I want to help you organize whatever it is, like. I don't know, I just, I am also learning to say no a lot more too because I don't have a lot of time and I have a family, a young family as well. But I guess I just want to be known as like a helpful person. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Jillian. Okay.